Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the weekly colloquium of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute. So as uh, many of you are probably aware, uh, the Institute's mission is to promote research at the intersection of artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing, and IoT for the digital, to enable the digital transformation of business, government, and society. So we are a consortium of several uh, universities who are listed here and funded by C3.ai and with computing support uh, from Microsoft and the Lawrence Berkeley Labs at Berkeley and, uh, and National Center for Supercomputing Applications at Illinois. Uh, uh, in addition to today's colloquium, we have a number of other uh, excellent talks in the coming weeks. Uh, so the next speaker would be Herbrand Cedar from Berkeley on October 15th. And then there's Jennifer Lesgarden, Emmanuel Candes, Zivbar Joseph, Renee Vidal, Nancy Amato, Stefana Parasco and Karina Tarnida, and Karen Chapel for the rest of the semester. And it'll of course continue once the new semester begins uh, next year. Uh, roughly the talk will be 40 minutes, uh, uh, but uh, the speaker will um, pause every now and then to take questions. Uh, we're hoping that there'll be maybe 10 to 15 minutes of questions overall. Uh, please use the question and answer feature to ask questions and you can upload a question if you like. And so if we see a lot of upvotes for a question, we'll give priority to that question. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So today's talk is called Solving Prediction Problems in Health from Heart Attacks to COVID-19. And we have a distinguished uh, speaker, Ziad Obermeyer. He is an associate professor at the University of California at Berkeley, where he does research at the intersection of machine learning, medicine, and health policy. Uh, he was named an emerging leader by the National Academy of Medicine and has received many awards including the Early Independence Award, which is NIH's most prestigious award for exceptional junior scientists, and the Young Innovator Award from the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. So before moving to Berkeley, he was an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School, and he continues to practice emergency medicine in underserved communities. Ziad, please. Thank you so much for having me. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about some joint work um, that is uh, generously funded by um, C3, and that's with uh, Alexander Madri at MIT and Sundal Malanathan at um, University of Chicago. And I think the, um, you know, in some ways the background to this work is um, uh, me as a doctor um, asking myself where machine learning fits in. So I, almost being a little bit jealous of where machine learning has fit into other fields and, and seeing all of the amazing things that it does and realizing that, you know, medicine at its core is it's a field about treating disease. And so there's a lot of things in medicine that look and feel a lot like biology. We do research um, in the laboratory to find treatments for disease. We test if those work in randomized trials. And you know, I think there are a lot of people doing very exciting work applying machine learning to those kinds of problems, but it's also clear that this is not the home court for machine learning. Causal inference, you know, it doesn't solve causal inference problems uh, like this out of the box. And so, you know, as I was thinking about, you know, what are the things in medicine um, where you could really profitably apply machine learning and, and see it shine the way it has in other areas, I think like, you know, part of that was rethinking medicine, not just as a biological science, but as a data science and, and looking at it through that lens and trying to see if there are problems that, you know, machine learning could, could profitably be applied to there. And so the, the way, um, you know, we, we think about this is, is actually um, through, at the risk of being overly simplistic, through the lens of two toy policy decisions. So I'm going to walk through these for like five minutes um, just to give you a sense of at least where um, where for me, machine learning is going to really dramatically influence the practice of medicine over the next 10 to 20 years. But I'm going to start with a completely non-medical example, um, which is that uh, if you imagine yourself as a policymaker in a um, drought-ridden country, one of the things that you might consider doing is investing resources into doing a rain dance um, that would increase rainfall and, and increase crop yields. Um, now, Imagine yourself as a different policymaker in a country where it rains a lot, um, walking, well, if not to the office because of COVID, walking somewhere else and wondering, 
whether or not you should bring your umbrella. So these are two important decisions that policymakers face. Um, and in both cases, we can bring data to bear to help us answer those questions and to give us good answers to the questions of whether you should invest resources in doing a rain dance, whether you should bring an umbrella to work. Um, one of these questions is a traditional causal inference question and the other is a prediction question. And I think it's useful to just separate those two out because I think this is for me the key to seeing the kinds of problems that machine learning um, can apply to in medicine um, and in rainfall. So the first thing that might uh, strike you about these two decisions is that they have a lot of common elements. So there's a decision that's important. There are payoffs from making that decision well. Um, and then there's a data frame that you're going to use to, um, and, and we're going to use to help us answer these questions. The key variable in both cases is rain. Um, and then there are some contextual variables about the weather. And in both of these settings, if we want to use data science to help us answer these questions, we're going to use that data frame to estimate a function but the goal is gonna be very, very different depending on whether we're answering a rain dance question or an umbrella question. Um, and so a lot of that comes down to what the key unknown is um, in these two decisions. So when you're thinking about whether or not to do a rain dance, you're very interested in rain. Um, you might be interested in also understanding some of the other contextual factors that produce rain, um, and you're interested in understanding the payoffs that come from rain. But when you're thinking about your decision, the key unknown in this system is this arrow here, the causal effect of rain dance on rain. If that causal effect is there, then it makes sense to do a rain dance. And if it's not, then it doesn't. That's a causal inference problem. And by contrast, the key unknown with an umbrella is very different. So despite the similarities, rain, weather, payoffs, and a decision, the key quantity of interest is very different. That arrow is not the key quantity of interest. We don't care about the causal effect of the umbrella on rain as much as it feels like when you forget your umbrella that causes it to rain. Um, that apparently doesn't happen. Um, what we're interested in is whether or not rain will be present. Um, and if it is, then we get a payoff from our decision to bring an umbrella. And if it's not present, then we don't. And so the key unknown here is not the effect of the umbrella on either rain or on your payoffs. We know that when you bring an umbrella and it rains, you get the payoff. The key unknown is whether or not it's gonna rain. And so, you know, I think we all know that there are lots and lots of causal inference problems in medicine. That's what randomized trials of uh, vaccines for COVID-19, treatments for COVID-19, all of those things are um, traditional causal inference problems. And I think we pay a lot less attention traditionally in medical research to prediction problems, um, but I think there are quite a few. So why don't I uh, maybe just pause there for a moment and see if there are any uh, questions. I don't see any in the Q&A, but happy to um, stop and take them now. Okay, seeing none, I will uh, move right on. Um, so I wanted to take you through what I view as a, a very common uh, prediction problem in medicine that starts with the following scenario. So I, I um, my training, my medical training is in emergency medicine. And so a very common situation when you're working in the ER is a patient coming in with one or more of the following symptoms. So chest pain, trouble breathing, uh, nausea. Um, and when you see a patient like this, um, there are a bunch of tests that you can do um, in the ER, things like doing an, an ECG, an electrocardiogram, uh, doing laboratory studies, and all of those things are useful, but inconclusive for telling you one really important question that you need to know the answer to, which is, is this patient having a heart attack? And when I say heart attack, um, I mean a very specific thing, which is a blockage in one of the arteries that supplies the heart um, that if untreated would lead to very long-term damage as well as uh, risk of immediate death. So that's what I mean by heart attack is that acute blockage. Um, and it turns out that even though we've got lots of technology at our disposal in the ER, um, there's really only one way to get to the bottom of whether or not there's an acute blockage. And that's to do a series of um, expensive and risky and invasive tests, ranging from putting someone on a treadmill uh, to radiological studies that do the same thing, and at the extreme to threading a catheter up um, through, the, uh, through the arteries and into the, uh, into the heart itself to visualize whether or not there's a blockage. Um, and so all of those things, um, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're expensive, they carry risks to the patient, there's radiation, um, there's uh, injected medications that risk kidney damage. So these are not decisions that we want to take lightly. 
Um, and if you look at those decisions from the, from the vantage point of health economics and health policy, the overwhelming finding from the literature is that we do way too many of these tests. Um, and so by too many, I mean a very specific thing, which is that we test a lot of people, but we also get very low yield from that test. So over 90% of the time in most studies that we look at, um, the patient has the test and then nothing happens. Um, no treatments are delivered nothing because the test is negative and the patient has incurred all of the costs of testing and received none of the benefits. So over 90% of the time when we do these tests, it changes nothing. It just incurs cost and exposes patients to risk. So health economics, uh, of course, has a, a very compelling explanation for, for this behavior, which is that doctors and, and hospitals are um, even today um, paid largely by the test. So the more tests you do, um, the more revenue you get. And so it's in everyone's self-interest, uh, well, everyone uh, on the medical system side, not necessarily the patient side or the, the, the social policy side uh, to test more. And so that's what we get. We get a lot of testing and those tests don't turn up positives um, because we shouldn't be doing those tests and we're only doing them because of incentives. So the, that's an explanation I think that has a lot of uh, currency, but I wanna propose a different explanation and, and we're gonna use data to explore whether this alternative hypothesis is correct, which is that rather than incentives at work here, what we might be seeing is error. So figuring out whom to test is a very, very complex inference problem. And it's very conceivable that doctors might be making mistakes. And what we'd like to know is, are they making mistakes? And if so, um, how often and, and what kind of mistakes are they making? Uh, so let me just see. Oh, okay, because there's no new questions in the chat. Um, all right, so I wanna tell you a little bit uh, and just sketch in, in at a high level, the doctor's decision-making process. So let's consider a patient coming into the ER with a set of symptoms that, that we can all uh, observe and, and, and findings on exams that we're able to do in the ER, there are three options for the doctor. Um, now, if it's me, uh, one thing that happens more often than I'd like is that I just realize that I have no idea what's going on. Um, if I can't get to the bottom of it myself in the ER, I have the option to either put that patient in the hospital if I'm worried, or send them home if, you know, I don't know why you're having a tingling sensation in your left pinky finger, um, but I don't also care that much and so you can go home. Um, so that's one set of options if, if I can't get to the bottom of it. The other option is I've gotten to the bottom of it and I've diagnosed the patient with something that's not heart attack. Um, and so this could be um, a fracture, it could be pneumonia, um, it could be a viral infection, uh, whatever it is, it's not heart attack. And then the third option is I do suspect heart attack and, and I wanna do this test for those acute blockages um, in the coronary arteries. Um, if that blockage is present, then I kind of hit the jackpot and I'm able to deliver a number of treatments um, to that patient because I've discovered the blockage and these treatments are well validated um, in, in numerous huge clinical trials. And that treatment effect tau is just the difference between the patient's health and the state of the world where she gets the treatment, H1, and the state of the world where she doesn't. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the, the key. And what that means is that the decision to test is actually itself implicitly a prediction problem. So why is that the case? Well, we can write the benefit of the test as the product of two things. So the first thing is, is there a blockage or not? So that's B. Um, and what we see is that if there's a blockage, if that test is positive, then we get this huge return to treatment. But if that test is negative and that term is zero, then there's no treatment benefit. There's only the costs. There's the risks of the patient. Um, there's the financial um, dimension of this. And so the whole name of the game here is for the doctor to predict the yield of testing before she actually does the test. Um, and, and if my suspicion is sufficiently positive, um, uh, if it's over some threshold, then I should go ahead and do that test um, and confirm whether or not the patient has a blockage. Uh, and if not, then I should not do the test because it's not worth it. Um, and where that threshold is set is gonna depend of course on um, the, the, the relative costs and benefits of, of doing the test for, for a particular patient, but there should be some threshold at which benefits exceed cost. 
So for our purposes, we're going to really focus on that B term. And we're going to um, come back to this in a, in a little bit later, but we're going to focus mostly on younger, healthier patients. So these are people who are under 80 years old. Uh, it's one definition of young. Um, and people who don't have chronic life-limiting illnesses like cancer or dementia or things like that. So these are people that we'd expect at least um, doctors should consider testing because they would deliver the treatments. These patients aren't too frail um, to need the, the uh, or, or to, to have the risk of the treatments harming them on average. Um, let me uh, pause there after I've um, set this up and just make sure there aren't any um, questions. So you, you mentioned a couple of slides ago about errors. You can go back to that slide. And sure. Doctors make errors uh, and probably possibly test the wrong patient or, or so. So is it? And, but you also said that tests are overused. That people order too many tests because there's an incentive. I'm wondering: is the overuse possibly also could be an error correction mechanism? In the sense mm -hmm. that I don't know who to test, so I might as well test everybody because I could make a mistake, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you're if you're uncertain then you would certainly have a higher, um, higher threshold or depending on you know, the, the kind of errors you were trying to minimize. But of course, if you're uncertain, that implies that there are um, two kinds of errors. There's the error of commission and the error of omission. Um, and, and one interesting thing about the current models is that we don't actually, when we look at average yield in the tested, we don't actually end up looking at the untested people and ask what would have happened to them. So it's a very asymmetric definition of, of error right now. Um, and so that, that's our, one of our uh, two interests. One interest is looking at errors of, of commission, testing someone that didn't need to be tested. But we also need to consider errors of omission, failing to test someone um, that, that would have benefited from testing. But the, but the but but I guess to compensate for the fact that I guess there's the, the, there's a higher risk of somebody dying, and so I guess to compensate for that you would test more. I mean that seems like a more that's a natural reaction. So that could also be one reason for a lot of tests. Is what I'm trying. Yeah, to say. absolutely. So so if you got a huge benefit, then you would set the threshold lower and lower and lower um, to compensate for that. But critically, all of those kinds of explanations fundamentally rely on the idea that you're ranking people correctly. So you can kind of go further and further down into the risk distribution if your benefit justifies it. Um, and what we're interested in is, are people misranking? OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so just to give you a sense of how the doctor makes her decision, um, there is a number of data that she has available to her before the patient ever walks into the ER, um, demographics, uh, prior diagnoses, prior procedures. Um, and then there's also a number of things that she can do in the emergency department. Um, she can listen to the patient talk about um, her symptoms. She can ask questions. She can do a physical exam. She can do these tests, uh, laboratory testing and electrocardiograms um, in the ED. Um, and so what we're going to do is, is use some of these data um, and we're going to form an explicit prediction um, on that patient's risk, their likelihood of having a blockage using machine learning. And so we're gonna look at all of the patients who are getting tested either in the ER or in the few days, like um, you know, three days afterwards, which is the, the testing guidelines. Um, and we're gonna ask the question of all of the people who got tested, who ended up having a blockage? And our marker of having a blockage is if the physician saw a blockage, then they would put in um, a stent, a small flexible tube to open up that blockage. Um, Less commonly, they'd uh, use their knowledge of the anatomy to refer the patient to open heart surgery. But either way, we're gonna see um, evidence of that blockage in the physician's decision to apply a treatment um, to open that blockage up. So that's our explicit machine learning prediction fit on the tested patients. And then we're gonna compare those predictions to the implicit predictions that doctors are making revealed by their testing decision. So the testing decision is um, I'm gonna draw a threshold and I'm gonna estimate someone's risk and I'm gonna test everyone above my threshold. Um, and so that's the kind of uh, optimizing model of physician behavior um, that we're gonna kind of kick the tires on by comparing it to our own machine predictions. Um, there are some caveats that uh, I'm not gonna address but I'm gonna put them up in case anyone was wondering. One is about um, the fact that there could be over-treatment. Um, and, and to handle that, we use very, very conservative levels of, of treatment benefit estimates when we're doing our cost-effectiveness analysis. And we also don't have anything to say about um, the non-health benefits of doing these tests. So um, feeling better because you know you don't have a heart attack. 
So here's how we, we set up the, the prediction task. And I'm going to keep this at a high level, but very happy to go into, into details later. Um, if you imagine the patient coming into the emergency department at T0, we're going to look um, in the three years before that visit, and we're going to construct a number of features, um, 16,000 features, using all of the data we have available to us in the electronic medical record. Um, and then we're going to look in the, um, the 10 days after that patient's visit. Um, almost all of these are happening in the, the 48 to 72 hours after the, the ED visit, um, but there, there are the most liberal guidelines say you can test up to 10 days after the visit, so we, we include all of those. We're going to look to see who got tested and of those um, who had a blockage that ended up getting treated. Um, and we're going to use data from uh, one large academic hospital uh, where we've got about 250,000 emergency visits uh, over a four-year period. Um, we're going to do all of our training on a random two-thirds sample at the patient level. So we're, um, we're going to keep a one-third set of patients, not visits, because uh, patients have multiple visits, we have to keep them apart. And so all the results that I'll show you will be on that uh, holdout set of patients that the model has never seen. Um, I see there's one um, question uh, about um, our outcome construction. So um, right now we're looking at the people who got tested and what we're, what we're doing here is we're predicting um, who had a blockage found um, as part of that test. So we're not using death here, but I will show you outcomes um, in untested patients where we have death as well as a number of other adverse events. Um, so let me, um, so stay tuned and let me, let me come back to your question later. Okay, so um, one important note here is that um, if you think about the data that we have available to us, we're trying to help the physician make a decision. Um, and so everything that leads up to the physician's first contact with the patient. So all of their demographics, their diagnosed conditions, even what they say um, to the nurse at the triage desk, all of that is fair game. But unfortunately, once the physician starts making decisions about um, the physical exam, what tests to do, things like that, now we have a problem because we can't use those things that are the result of the physician's decision um, to inform our prediction that we'd like to give to the physician. So there's a circularity about that and a question about what data are available at the time that we want to influence the decision. That means that we stop looking as soon as the patient hits the triage desk of the ER. So all of our predictions are going to use data um, that are available to the doctor that we know with certainty the doctor um, could use at the time of making a decision um, about how to handle the patient in the ER. So um, I'm going to show you a few graphs uh, that, that look like this. So let me just talk through the axes first. Um, I'll tell you first that uh, as a starting point, the yield of testing. So um, among all the people that the doctors are worried enough about to do one of these invasive tests, um, the yield of testing is 12.5%. Um, so this is you know, a little better than, uh, than in, in some studies. Um, uh, this is a you know, high performing academic hospital. So maybe that's what it is, but that's, that's the average yield. Um, so on the x-axis here, I'm gonna show you the algorithms prediction. So I'm gonna rank people from lowest risk to highest risk. Um, and then on the y-axis, I'm gonna show you the yield conditional on that uh, being in that decile of predicted risk. Um, and so I've marked the average. And I think, you know, one of the amazing things that that was quite surprising to us was that we could actually um, predict this reasonably well. So all of these patients, remember, are people that the doctor was worried enough about to subject them to one of these invasive tests, looking for a subtle blockage in the coronary arteries. And what we're seeing is that, you know, the line slopes up. So the higher the risk that we predict the patient to be at, the more likely it is for the patient um, to actually have a blockage found on that test. Um, and you can see that there's quite a range here. So in the lowest uh, decile, the lowest 10% of predicted risk, uh, there's only uh, a 1.8 chance of finding a blockage. And in the top decile, it's over 50%. Um, you can convert those numbers into cost effectiveness numbers, like how much would you need to be willing to pay for a year of life um, to justify testing a person with um, this level of yield. And in that lowest decile, um, it's like almost a million dollars per life year. Um, most of the time when we are doing cost effectiveness analyses, our thresholds are around like 100,000 to maybe 150,000. Um, and in that top decile, by contrast, it's, it's, it's a bargain. It's under uh, $70,000 per life year. And that might make you wonder, well, um, that's in the tested people. Uh, what about 
patients as a whole. So these are people who look like they would be very cost effective to test. We should be testing people who look like this um, that the algorithm predicts to be, for example, in the top decile of risk. But when we look in our whole sample at people who have that level of risk that the algorithm predicts, and we look at what fraction are tested, only, um, only about half are tested. So the majority of these patients that the algorithm thinks, oh, this looks like someone who would have a very high yield of testing, the majority of those people are untested. Um, and so that brings up a set of really interesting and important questions um, around the untested patients. So remember, doctors have a lot of information um, that we don't have. And, and let me give you a kind of like back of the envelope calculation that should make you a little bit um, worried about this fact. So if we just added up all of the blockages that our algorithm thinks that we would find if we tested 100% of the untested people, um, we would estimate that there are nearly 3,000 heart attacks to be found in those untested people, just looking at their observable characteristics, generating a prediction, um, and, and totaling up how many heart attacks, how many blockages we think we would find. Um, by contrast, if we look at the tested people, how many heart attacks we actually found, we only find about 266. Um, and so that would imply that doctors are catching only a small fraction of heart attacks. Um, and that kind of doesn't pass the sniff test um, when you think about it. And when you think about why, well, remember what I mentioned, um, there are lots of things that the algorithm doesn't observe. So the algorithm doesn't observe um, the symptoms that the patient has. It doesn't observe the results of testing and it can't because we don't have those available at the time that we need to generate predictions to inform the decision. Um, and, and I think more broadly, there will, um, it's unlikely that we'll be in a world where we'll find everything to be observable. Doctors are always gonna have an information advantage because they're in the room uh, and we're not. And so there's always gonna be data that the doctor sees and uses in her decision-making that we don't see. Um, and, and that um, selective labels, the, the fact that we have selection bias into the labeling process, I think is a really important and underappreciated challenge in a lot of these uh, machine learning tasks because we don't see the thing that we wanna see. We can generate predictions in the people who got tested. We can make a guess as to what would have happened in the untested, um, but we'll never know because we don't have the labels in the untested. And of course, because the doctor is actually not just flipping coins, she could have left that patient untested for a very good reason that we don't see. Um, and so we can't take those predictions at face value in the untested people because we've fit them on the tested people and the untested people might be different on some unobservable things that we don't have a chance to see. Um, so let me pause there and just um, uh, see what questions we have. So uh, JP asks if insurance status and income are predictors of testing. Um, yes, they are in fact. Um, and so there, there are uh, lots of reasons to believe that the tested people are different from the untested people. Things like insurance status and, and even block level income are things that we observe. And so we can adjust for those. Um, the things that we might be just as worried about, excuse me, that we can't adjust for are, for example, uh, the, the, um, the pallor of the patient's skin, whether they were looking uncomfortable, whether they, um, they look depressed. All of those things are things we can't adjust for when we're trying to um, map our predictions from the tested to the untested. Uh, and then uh, let's see, there was another question on uh, studies with follow-up on the untested to see if heart attack is found later. Uh, thank you, Dan. You, actually, I should get you to um, give my talk instead uh, because that's exactly what we, what we do next. So um, we're gonna look in those untested people for different labels. And it turns out that there's a whole medical literature on this um, because up until the early 1980s, medicine as a field had very little in the way of treatments for heart attacks. So there were randomized trials comparing home versus hospital management for patients that had a heart attack. So we know a lot about what happens to people who have untreated heart attack, and we can look for exactly those things um, in our data because our data are, are longitudinal electronic health record data. Um, so so here are the adverse events in these untested patients, and we're going to look in the untested patients um, in, the, in the month after the visit. And we're gonna just see as a function of the algorithm's predicted risk, um, what is the rate of outcomes that these patients have? So the two lines here are first um, adverse cardiac events. So these are uh, people who have been diagnosed with a heart attack, who have had an urgent procedure to open up a blockage. 
or who have had a cardiac arrest. And in addition to those things, we observe in our laboratory data on these patients, um, troponin, a biomarker of damage to the heart above a pretty high threshold of 0.1. So these are people who have had biomarker confirmed adverse cardiac events um, in, in, the, in the month after they were untreated. Um, and if you add in uh, death, as, um, uh, as, as is often done in these studies of, of adverse events, the rate gets even higher. Um, and so, you know, these are people who in the month have either a, a four or an 8% chance of having one of these adverse events. And we can actually compare that to the thresholds that are in the clinical literature. So this is exactly the, the set of outcomes that the clinical literature uses to decide on who should be considered for testing or not. If you go untested and you have one of these bad events above a rate of 2%, that's the most uh, risk tolerant clinical decision rule, then you know, the guidelines are clear. You're the kind of person that doctors should consider testing. Um, and yet all of these people in this highest quintile of predicted risk um, don't, uh, you know, the model could have told the doctor and, and the doctor did not test this patient and they went on to have um, adverse events at a, at a very high rate. Um, so there's a question on the labeling and, and how that was implemented. So in the tested, we just look to see in the people who were tested, who had the intervention that implies that that test found a blockage. Um, in these untested patients, we just look in the longitudinal follow-up data in the electronic health record, and we look to see the occurrence of these diagnosis or procedure codes, um, a, uh, a death um, label, which is merged in from state social security data, um, and then we also look at the laboratory studies uh, for that biomarker confirmation of these adverse events. So it's all data that are drawn from the longitudinal electronic health record um, that we have available to us in, in the hospital data. Um, now, we can also look at patients where, you know, as I mentioned, when we think about the doctor's option sets, I can test the patient or I can be worried about them um, and admit them to the hospital, or I can diagnose them with something that's clearly not heart attack um, or I can just send them home if I'm not worried about them at all. And when you compare those patients to all of the other patients, they have very similar rates of outcome. So we don't think that this is just, you know, the doctors, they're not telling us that the patient had heart attack, they're not testing them, but they're worried. We don't think that's what it is. Um, and even more striking are in the patients who are actually sent home. So these are the patients that you should be least worried about. If you're a doctor, they come in with chest pain, you say, oh, it's, you know, probably acid reflux or something like that. Um, those people are also well above the threshold uh, for these adverse events. And those adverse events start to look really, really bad uh, if, you, if you extend the window out to 180 days after they were sent home from the ER. So all of this is consistent with these patients being at genuinely high risk, the doctor not suspecting that, um, and taking actions that, that end up um, resulting in the patient being undiagnosed and untreated um, for heart attack. Um, so one of the, I think, um, interesting things of observing so much about um, the patient, but also what the physician is doing, is that we can try to get some insights into what's going on. And I'll just say that this is very incompatible with the idea that incentives are driving physicians to test more. Um, all of these patients, if you, if you had a patient that was at high risk um, in front of you in the ER, you should definitely test that patient, even if you don't care about that patient's health, if you're purely profit maximizing, because these kinds of patients are, they're like ATM machines for the hospital. There are procedures, there's ICU stays, there's a lot of just pure incentive reason to test these people and bring them into the hospital, not to send them home. Um, that doesn't benefit anyone. Um, and so this seems very unlikely to be purely a story about incentives. Um, and so what we do is rather than just using an algorithm to predict the patient's true risk, we also build an algorithmic model of the physician behavior and look to see how that relates to true risk. So specifically what I mean is um, we take our predictions, our, our kind of like ensemble um, machine learning model of true risk, and then we progressively regularize it. So we make it simpler and simpler and simpler on a number of different dimensions. And then we're gonna compare those simplified models of true risk to the physician's testing decision. Um, and so here's what we find. So the, the dark line at the top is what we find when we're actually just predicting the outcome. And you can see this looks like a standard machine learning curve where as you increase the number of variables, which is one measure of complexity, um, the predicted accuracy goes up and up and up, and then it starts to overfit and it goes down. So that looks like kind of exactly what we'd expect. Now, the interesting thing is that 
when we use those simplified models of true risk, so progressively fewer variables, and we turn that simplified model to predict the doctor's decision, we find something very interesting, which is that the model that best fits the doctor's decision is far simpler than the best model of risk. So the best model of risk um, uses about 100 variables, 93 variables is where you get the maximum accuracy. The maximum accuracy for predicting the physician's testing decision only has 15 variables. And these are things like age, sex, um, chest pain, et cetera, um, things like that. Um, so Ravi uh, asks, could fear of lawsuits drive testing? Um, there's actually mixed evidence. Some studies show that you know when you uh, reform malpractice law, testing goes down, um, others don't. But I think, you know, the, this goes back to uh, Srikant's question earlier, is that all of those things, you know, lawsuits, you, you could imagine a world where lawsuits led you drive the risk, you know, drive your testing threshold down. But that way of thinking also implicitly bakes in this idea that doctors are ranking patients accurately. They're just going way too low in the risk distribution relative to the social benefit um, of a given test. Um, and so here, I think like what's very inconsistent about this for me is that if you are worried about lawsuits, these are the these high risk untested patients are exactly the ones that you would test because these are the ones that go on to have really bad outcomes at 30 days. Um, and so I don't see this as a, as a story that can be explained by malpractice either because malpractice would suggest that these are exactly the kinds of patients that you should be testing in the ER if you're risk averse. Um, so I'll just kind of try to tie this, this up and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll move on. But you know, the, the, the traditional model, um, whether you're thinking about um, incentives like cost or incentives around lawsuits, is pretty much that you, you, know, you as a doctor, you see a distribution of risk and there is some optimal threshold that integrates all of the costs of testing, the benefits of testing to the patient. And that's where you should be testing. But because of incentives, you move down into the risk distribution. Um, and so you start testing more and more low risk people. And you can see that's why you get low average yield because above your, above your testing threshold, you're getting these high risk orange patients, but you're also getting a bunch of these purple patients that don't do you much good and, and, and they dilute out your yield. The alternative model is imagine if patients are actually not ordered correctly in this distribution. The physician thinks they are, um, but they're not. So there you could also see that when you move the threshold down above the threshold, you're gonna get a mix of purple and orange. You're gonna get high and low risk patients above the threshold um, and below the threshold. And no matter where you set the threshold, you'll find that. And that will give you both low average yield and also this phenomenon that we observe, which is a bunch of untested high risk patients. So one, one um, implication of this um, is that when we, tell physicians to test more or less, they are not gonna do a good job. And so here we're using the variation in someone's likelihood of testing based on um, the particular team of nurses that's on in triage. This seems to influence testing quite a bit in a way that's um, independent of patient characteristics. Um, and so what I've done is I've sorted uh, shifts into shifts where patients just get tested a lot by the, you know, as a function of what the nursing staff does and shifts where they don't. And so what you can see if you compare, for example, the green line to the gray line at the bottom is that when physicians or, or, or whoever, when, when our health system cuts back on testing, they do cut back on wasteful tests. So these are patients that are low predicted risk and they are far less likely to be tested when the testing rate goes down. The problem is that when the testing rate goes down, high risk patients are also much less likely to be tested. And that's a big problem. So this is throwing out the baby um, with the bathwater. And we see this not just in our single hospital data, but if we rerun this whole pipeline nationally across hospitals and Medicare data, we see the same pattern. High testing hospitals test everyone more and low testing hospitals test everyone less. Um, and so we see this same phenomenon when we leave the decision up to the doctors is that their marginal patients just come from everywhere in the risk distribution. They don't just walk down the risk distribution and test progressively more and more low risk patients. So I'll just try to uh, summarize here. Um, misprediction seems to play a role in driving um, both underuse, testing people who shouldn't be tested, but also failing to test people who should be tested. And this has nothing to do with incentives, which means that all of the policy tools that we have available to us, 
um, making it more expensive to test, uh, reducing testing supply, all those things will just cause doctors and hospitals to test less. It will not help them to test better. Um, and so I think I'm very optimistic about uh, machine learning here, not just for decision aids, but also for helping us understand physician behavior um, a little bit better. Um, I'll just, uh, in the last five minutes, I'll, I'll tell you about one other um, decision where I think machine learning could really help, um, which is uh, something that I saw a lot when I was working in the ER. So I, I work, um, uh, whenever I can get away, I go uh, work for a week or so in a hospital on the Navajo Nation um, where there's been a lot of COVID. And when I was working in the ER uh, there over the summer, I did see a lot of patients with COVID-19 um, in the ER. But one interesting fact is that the sickest patients that I saw in my time there were not the patients in the ER. They were the patients that um, I was called to see upstairs in the hospital when they were three or four days into their hospital stay. They'd been admitted for COVID, they were looking okay, they were on a little bit of oxygen, and all of a sudden they deteriorated. And this is one of the reasons that COVID-19 is so scary uh, for clinicians because you don't know who that's going to happen to, um, possibly just because we don't know enough about COVID-19 to understand what happens and, and to whom. And so, you know, not everyone is lucky enough to be in the hospital when they deteriorate. So some patients unfortunately get sent home from the ER and they come back in respiratory distress. Uh, other patients uh, discharge themselves from hospitals and, and go for a drive around Washington, DC. You know, anything can happen, um, but it is very, very risky and it feels like rolling the dice. So, um, so I think this is one other area where machine learning can be incredibly valuable. And this is ongoing work um, uh, that I'm doing where, you know, we just look at all of the patients who are in the ER with respiratory problems and we try to answer the question, how do we prioritize who needs to be in the hospital? And how do we figure out who can safely be sent home? And so the specific thing that we do is we, we're getting um, about a half a million x-rays um, from patients in the ER from a large health system that we're working with. And we're feeding those initial x-rays um, into an algorithm that, that's going to look over the next week um, and predict who has evidence of pulmonary collapse. And that can be evidence on the x-ray. It can be evidence um, from the rest of the hospital stay. So needing to be intubated, needing mechanical ventilation, things like that. All of these things that are um, orbiting around the idea of pulmonary collapse. And I'll just point out a couple of things about this prediction because I think it's different from what a, lot of, uh, what a lot of other people are doing. We are not actually predicting the label of COVID-19. Um, and we're not doing that because whether or not someone has COVID is in fact not the key unknown for the decision maker in this case. To know whether or not someone belongs in the hospital um, or at home, you need to know the probability of deteriorating, not the probability of COVID. Um, in addition, we actually have tests for COVID, so it's not really clear um, why that prediction is going to help the decision maker um, at all in the absence of, you know, some um, catastrophic shortage of testing, which we don't actually have when, when we're dealing with patients in the ER, uh, even though we have it more broadly in our society where not everyone who needs to get tested um, has access to a test. Now, we're not even restricting to patients who have COVID-19, um, and that's, you know, uh, I think, the result of a hypothesis that, that we have. So this is uh, either going to be falsified or not. But the physiological insight here is that the lungs, the lungs are just not very creative. So, you know, no matter what happens to the lungs, if you inhale a toxin, if you get infected with a bacterium, if you get infected with a virus, there's a, there's a final common pathway of injury. So the lung doesn't have a very big repertoire. Um, it no matter what happens almost to the lung, it goes into a phenomenon called acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that is how nearly all patients die, not just from COVID, but also from influenza, um, from lots of other respiratory problems. And so our hypothesis is that we can learn about deterioration in COVID-19 from deterioration in other illnesses. Um, and that lets us really get um, enough data to bring the modern machine learning playbook uh, to bear on this problem in a way that you can if you're only dealing with patients who have COVID-19 because no one hospital is going to have enough um, to really uh, let that playbook shine. So I'll just close with a couple of thoughts and then I'll leave time for questions. Um, I think I'm very optimistic about the existence of many, many really, really important prediction problems in medicine. Um, and so I've talked about two, but I think people will just start finding these all over the place in the area of testing and triage uh, and many other problems. 
um, because medicine is fundamentally a data science. It's about information. Physicians are information processors. Um, and I think that machine learning has a lot to offer to those, um, uh, to those decisions that, that depend on information. But as, as I, I hope I tried to convey, um, making those predictions useful means that you have to very carefully map out who the decision maker is, what data are available at what time, what's the benefit of having a better decision or a worse decision. Um, and it also means avoiding these kinds of statistical pitfalls around um, selection bias into the labeling process, for example, um, that, that, can, that can really complicate efforts and, and make our predictions a lot less reliable than they look in our training data. Um, and finally, I'll just point out that, you know, for us, the, the destination of a lot of this work is not just a paper. We, we do want to roll these things out um, into a randomized trial. And we're working with um, a, a large health system now to implement our heart attack testing pathway um, in, a, in a block randomized trial. So why don't I uh, stop there and I'll just uh, take a quick look at the Q&A and see. Um, Oh, perfect. So there is a, a question about the, the clinical decision process. Um, so I think, um, you know, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, questions about whether or not physicians will adopt uh, decision aids. And, you know, I think I uh, have a slightly more optimistic take on this than, than most people. Um, I think that most physicians are just really afraid of making a mistake. And if they see a tool that can help them not make a mistake, they will adopt that tool. I don't think we see in medicine what we see in a lot of um, other areas, like people, if anything, our problem in medicine is that we adopt too much new technology, not too little new technology. Um, but at the same time, there's a, there's a playbook in medicine for getting new technology adopted, and that's a randomized trial. And I think if a randomized trial shows that something is effective at, at improving patient outcomes, then it will be adopted. Um, I think a lot of the skepticism around AI comes from a very reasonable place, which is that we have no evidence that this actually improves outcomes to date. Are there any other questions? So have you answered everything up to that? Uh, yeah, oh, let, me, let me just pull the Q&A back up. Uh, let's see. I think uh, Dan and Pega's question, yes. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Siddhartha asks, what data are used to predict the, the doctor's test decision? Um, so what we do here is we, um, this is in the, the comparison of the, the doctor's decision to the algorithm's um, decision. We actually use the, uh, the exact same data that we use to fit the algorithm. So all of the laboratory studies, vital signs, diagnoses, procedures. Um, so it's, it's in fact the exact same predictor. It's just a regularized version of that same predictor of, of true outcomes of, of, of the patient's risk. Um, but we, we regularize that and, and make it very simple and, and bring it down until it gets to good predictions of what the doctor is actually doing. Okay, and then, uh, oh, sorry, there's a, Tatiana asked a question that I think I missed. Um, using math to calculate all possible combinations of genes uh, as in the game of life. Uh, that is a tough one. <laughs> that is a tough one, Tatiana. I, um, I think that, um, you know, one, I think uh, I'll, I'm not gonna, I, I have no idea how to answer the question, but, but I'll, I'll just point out one, um, one similarity here, which is that I think that we often, um, we often think about genetics as prediction problems, but in fact, genetics is a really tough causal inference problem with a lot of interactions and very little ability to observe potential outcomes. Now, there are some interesting solutions to this around like Mendelian randomization, where you can assume that one allele or another is a coin flip in a population and trace out the outcomes. But I just think it's really, really hard to apply this toolkit. Um, to, to a lot of problems in genetics. Not to say that it, it can't be done, but I just think it's really not straightforward at all um, because we don't observe the potential outcomes that we'd like to see. Um, but you know, we don't see someone's state of health where they have the gene versus where they don't. We just see one state. So I, I think these problems are really complicated and I think that's why there's so much innovation and causal inference in machine learning that's applied to genetics problems, but they're not straightforward problems. Uh, Steph asks if I've found the Kaisers and all to be more interested uh, because they capture the benefits of the efficiency gains. Um, I think that there's, uh, we, we've, we've talked to a number of different um, health systems 
And I wouldn't say that there's actually a big difference based on the incentive structure um, of the hospital. And I think the reason why is because um, the, way we're, the way we typically think about misallocation in this space is over-testing. And so, and we find a lot of over-testing. And you, you might think like, oh, um, Kaiser and, and other places that are incentivized to take care of patients in a non-fee-for-service model, they're going to be really excited about this because they save money um, if, you, if you fix over-testing. Um, the converse of that, though, is that there are a lot of high-risk untested patients. So these are patients that would generate a lot of money in a fee-for-service model that we're not currently capturing. Um, and so I think that's why we haven't found a big difference in receptivity to this work. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the health system where we're furthest along in turning this into a randomized trial and very close to signing an agreement is a very traditional uh, fee-for-service type place um, that I think is, is interested in both. Uh, and Steph has a follow-up question around uh, malpractice insurers. Um, yeah, I think that, um, so will, malpract will malpractice be a driver uh, that would tip this towards um, innovation? I, I think there are a lot of reasons that um, once people start using these tools and, and seeing the benefit of them, there are going to be a lot of changes in how the incentives work. Um, and I, I think that's one of them. I think it's a great point. I think there's a question by Shinmei Olin that went up because I guess it was uploaded. Uh, yeah, so, um, okay, thanks. So, so why are physicians omitting testing? So I didn't, um, I didn't have a chance to get into um, these results as much as I would have liked, but I think the starting point is our result that physicians are basically uh, overly regularized. So physicians are basically, they're using a model of, of true risk that is actually correct, conditional on complexity. But the reason the model does so much better is because it can actually incorporate much, much more complexity. That's the key to the model's um, edge. And so part of the story, I think, is, is that the, the root cause of the errors of omission are the same as the root cause of the errors of commission, which is that physicians can't, we can't hold in our heads the entire information set that we would need to, to solve this very, very complicated inference problem. So part of it is like a, you know, this is what people refer to as like a bounded rationality model where physicians are basically correct. They're basically optimal, but subject to some condition about how complex of a model they can use. Now, we also, um, and, and we have some of this in, in the working paper um, uh, that, that I can, I'll just paste a link to in a second. There's also some evidence of some concrete biases. So physicians also tend to overweight some risk information. So it's true that patients with chest pain are more likely to be having heart attack, but it also seems like physicians dramatically overweight chest pain in their predictions. And so they, that leads them to over-test people with chest pain and it leads them to under-test people with other symptoms relative to what their yield would be. So I think we're seeing evidence of a lot of just cognitive errors um, that lead to both under-testing and over-testing at the same time. Um, There's a, a question by Felipe Alamos. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Felipe. I, you know, I think there are probably the most important challenges that we'll face when we're implementing these tools at large scale are the challenges that we don't even know uh, how to anticipate right now. Uh, so I'm looking forward to those. I think right now, um, a lot of the uh, pain points are actually around data. And so getting data, um, either getting data out of the health system so that we can rebuild our predictive uh, tools in their setting, um, figuring out how to layer our predictions on top of their electronic medical record, um, et cetera. And so, you know, I think like a lot of the pain points right now are just data access issues. Um, I think when we go into implementation, um, we're, I think we have a lot of um, faith that, you know, the, the, the implementation, like convincing physicians to at least try this out is actually not going to be as hard as, as many people think, just based on some, some interviews and focus groups that we've run already. So right now, the, the things that we're facing are really just the mechanics of data access and delivering the prediction to the right person at the right time. Um, Shinya has a follow-up question. Uh, the model is supposed to be more powerful, catching more features. So do I mean that the model has the same bias as the physician? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think that the reason that we're able to see the physician's bias 
um, is because we're looking at the physician through the lens of the model prediction. So we have our prediction that's, you know, it's, um, we use a subset of the information available um, to the physician and we make a prediction. That prediction, you know, turns out to be pretty good, it looks like, in, in predicting yield in, in the tested people and predicting bad things happening to the untested people. So then we look at the physician's decision through the lens of that prediction. And we see that the physician is predictably over testing some people and under testing other people. And we're able to interrogate that difference and figure out what are the characteristics of patients um, that lead physicians to over or under test? Um, what are the limitations in the physician's decision model um, that, uh, that, that could lead to that? So no, I, I think it doesn't have the same biases. And in fact, that's why we can see the physician biases is because we have this alternative. It's like a mirror to hold up to the physician. I think you've answered all the questions, and I think there's a compliment from Harsh. Oh, Chow yes. Saying, Thank you, Harsh. That's great very kind. Talk. Yeah. Well, I'd like to express my thanks and everybody's thanks at the Institute and the audience. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much for sharing this with us, and uh, Thank thanks you. to the audience for attending, and hope to see many of you at next week's colloquium. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.